Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry McKnight, and I am the Director of the Audit Department for GRF, CPA, and Advisors. On behalf of our firm, I want to wish everyone a very happy new year and a warm welcome to our first webinar for 2022, the Nonprofit State of the Union 2022 Industry Update to Tax-Exempt Organizations. I'd like to start off today with some quick housekeeping items and explain what you will need to do to earn CPE credit. Participants seeking CPE credit today must complete and submit a short evaluation survey that will appear automatically following the webinar. You will be asked to recall these words in order to receive credit. Please write down the CPE words when they are given and hold on to them until you receive your certificate. They will not be provided again. If you have any technical questions or issues during the discussion, please use the chat function to speak with our administrator for assistance. The slide deck and recording from today's discussion will be available on the event page on our website. Technical support and CPE questions may be addressed to Nathan at nmclbeen at grfcpa.com. Today's learning objective is to provide an overview of the nonprofit industry for 2022. And there is a recommended CPE of the one hour. So as we start off the new year, we are delighted to announce GRF has promoted four of our best and brightest to partners effective January 1. Max Manling, Lindsay Dean, Tricia Catabini are now partners within the, our audit department. Collectively, they have spent 50 plus years working directly with our nonprofit organizations, providing audits and consulting services. Melissa Musser is now a partner within our risk advisory service department. She has 20 plus years helping organizations identify and mitigate risk from a holistic view. Our four new partners will be joined by our, my esteemed colleagues, Amy Bolin, a partner within the audit department, and Dick LaCastro, the partner and director of our nonprofit tax. Together, they will give you a state of the union address for the nonprofit industry. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Max and let's get started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Uh, to kick off today's conversation, we're gonna take a look at some high priority topics for nonprofits as we move into the new year specifically what's on the horizon in terms of new accounting standards, ongoing considerations pertaining to COVID-19 and the related legislation, and a few general trends and hot topics affecting the industry. Looking first at the accounting standards, there are a number of new items coming into effect in 2022, one of the most significant of which is the new auditor reporting standards. Now, while these standards directly affect the auditors more so than nonprofit organizations themselves, it is important for anyone working in not-for-profit accounting to become familiar with them. These standards are gonna be effective for fiscal years ending after December 15th, 2021. So if you have a December 31 year end or later, you will see the impact of these standards reflected in your upcoming audit reports. Uh, one of the most notable changes here is sort of a reordering and restructuring of the auditor's report on the financial statements. The auditor's opinion will now be presented as the first paragraph of the report followed by the basis for opinion paragraph, which will now include a disclosure of the auditor's independence with respect to the auditee. The description of management and the auditor's responsibilities for the financial statements have been expanded and enhanced as well. On the management side, there will be a new statement that management is required to evaluate whether there are any conditions or events that raise doubt about the ability of the organization to continue as a going concern. And in the auditor section, there'll be more uh, of a robust definition around terms like reasonable assurance and materiality, as well as a more in-depth description of the audit process. There will also be some new inquiries and communications between the auditors and governance concerning significant unusual transactions, difficult or contentious matters, and related party transactions. And there will also now be a requirement for the auditors to review the not-for-profit organization's annual report and to consider whether any information in that annual report is materially inconsistent with the audited financial statements. So if your organization does prepare an annual report, that document will eventually need to be shared with the auditors for their review. Um, this is not in any way intended to result in a delay in completion of the audit. You can go ahead and finalize your audit 
before that annual report is issued, uh, but you will just need to share the annual report with the auditors once it's ready. So the takeaway from this is that there are going to be some new questions asked, potentially the need to spend a bit more time reviewing and discussing the audit reports as we all get used to the new presentation. Another significant change coming into effect this year is the new lease accounting standard. Uh, this one has been on the radar for several years. Uh, finally, after a number of delays and extensions, it is now coming into effect. And while I expect that there is a general familiarity with the standard at this point, to quickly recap, the standard will require that all leases extending beyond 12 months from the financial statement date be recorded on the balance sheet as a right of use asset and lease liability initially measured at the present value of the future minimum lease payments. The lease standard is effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2021. So while it's not required in your financial statements until December 31st, 2022, you do have the option to early adopt. For example, if you entered into a new office lease in 2021, you can elect to go ahead and adopt that standard for the December 2021 year end. So if you haven't taken any action yet to go ahead and implement that standard, uh, definitely time to do so. Reach out to your auditors, your outside accountants, and begin working through that adoption process. Another new standard to mention is ASU 2020-07, which updates the requirements for presentation and disclosures of gifts in kind. This was really developed with the goal of just providing financial statement users with additional clarity on the types of gifts in kind that are received how they're valued, how they're used. It's not going to change the accounting treatment of gifts in kind per se, but it does require separate presentation of gifts in kind in the statement of activities and disclosure of the different categories of gifts in kind received, whether they are used in program activities or monetized and the related policies and procedures, as well as disclosures of any donor restrictions on the gifts in kind and a description of the techniques used to value them. This standard is gonna be effective for annual periods beginning after June 15th, 2022. So still plenty of time to work on this one. And lastly, as we move forward into 2022, some organizations are still ironing out the details with respect to adoption of the new revenue recognition standards. So certainly important to maintain our focus on those. In general, you'll need to perform an evaluation of your various revenue streams, determine whether they are classified as exchange transactions or contributions. If the revenue is considered an exchange, you need to document the five-step process for recognizing revenue. Whereas if the transaction is a contribution, you need to determine whether there are any conditions that preclude immediate recognition of that revenue, whether there's any donor restrictions on the revenue, and then recognize revenue in the appropriate class of net assets when any conditions are met. So moving on now to take a quick look at some COVID-19 considerations that may continue to have an impact in the new year. If your organization has received grant funding from the CARES Act, those awards, of course, may be subject to the Uniform Guidance Compliance Audit. So very important to ensure that any CARES Act grant spending is tracked and identified separately, and that you are familiar with the associated compliance requirements. One specific compliance requirement to highlight is that that's applicable to CARES Act funding, as well as any other federal grants, is the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act reporting requirements. Uh, this will apply when you make subcontracts or subawards to other organizations. Those subawards are required to be reported in the federal subaward reporting system, and that reporting is subject to audit. So definitely something uh, that auditors will be asking about in the coming year. With regards to the payroll protection program loans, as of present, um, about 86% of all of the PPP loans have been forgiven. So overall, the PPP loan program is winding down. However, the Small Business Administration and other agencies do retain the right to go back and review the forgiveness applications and reassess their forgiveness decisions. They have anywhere from four to six years uh, to do that, depending on the size of the loans. So especially for any larger loans over about $2 million, there is some likelihood that there's going to be additional scrutiny. So certainly do recommend maintaining the records of, of how those loans were spent, the associated forgiveness applications, just in case questions do come up in the future. Uh, the proper treatment of the employee retention credits has also raised a lot of discussion recently. The AICPA has indicated that these credits should be treated as revenues for financial statement purposes, while for tax purposes, they are considered a reduction of payroll tax costs. So something to keep an eye on there as uh, the year-end reporting is completed. 
Other COVID related issues to consider this year, uh, looking at internal controls, the impacts on, on, of working virtually, making sure your control procedures have been appropriately modified to address risks of operating in the, the remote environment. And then from a financial statement perspective, um, with regards to disclosures, um, consideration of going concern issues, contingencies or uncertainties, changes in your budgets or operational plans, subsequent events, anything going on COVID related that might warrant additional disclosure in the financials. And finally, on the next slide, um, you'll see here just a few trends and hot topics that we're going to discuss a bit more later in the presentation. I will note that GRF is presenting a webinar on cryptocurrency on February 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I definitely would recommend tuning in for that. But I'm going to hand it over to Tricia to expand on these subjects and a few others as we look at top risks for nonprofits in 2022 right after our first polling question. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've come to our first polling question. Uh, first of all, is your organization optimistic about 2022 and beyond in terms of your revenue and impact? A, not at all. B, somewhat optimistic. C, very optimistic. D, unsure. Please take a moment now to answer. While participants are submitting their answers, I'll provide the first CPE word. The first CPE word is asset. If you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you will need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the first CPE word is asset, A-S-S-E-T. Well, you can see from the results of the poll here, it looks like we're Somewhat optimistic, which is good. Um, very optimistic, I guess, which is very good. Um, but you'll see there's you know, still some people who aren't optimistic and some that are unsure. So I'm glad to hear that we're at least you know, heading towards that optimistic uh, side of things. Yes, and Amy, I think one of the things to just talk about too during this time is obviously the risks that we've seen. So we have a couple of items here that we've labeled as the top risks related to the nonprofits looking 2022 and perhaps beyond. Um, I really do wanna make this a little bit interactive with you all. So as we talk through some of these risks, I love to see some collaboration between you. You have peers on this call with you. Um, so just chat amongst each other about things that you're seeing uh, that you are either optimistic about, maybe some challenges that you've had during this process of COVID and just trying to figure out what we're going to be doing for the future. So in terms of the top risk that I have, or one of the top risks that I have here, a trend in giving. Now, depending on the type of organization that you are, uh, you could either see this as actually a pro, an advantage for you, or a con for some organizations. So we saw a major shift last year when it comes to donors um, in their giving. Uh, we've seen more of a shift for giving to a human service-based type of nonprofits, you know, those that are doing food assistance and housing assistance or, or health related type of services and less to cultural institutions, those organizations that are, you know, the museums, the arts based type of organizations and or libraries. Um, so according to the most recent Giving USA annual report, so this was related to the one that was issued last year in 2021, there was really a dispor disproportionate fundraising experience among nonprofits in 2020. And I think, you know, that does not come as any surprise for many of us at this point in time. We've seen significant increases in giving to education, to human services, to public benefit society, international affairs, environmental and animal causes. And there's also been a shift to organizations that are really focused on public society benefit and human services. So that makes sense considering we've seen a very urgent need for vulnerable communities throughout this pandemic and a very renewed focus on racial and, and social justice issues. So giving to those cultural institutions again went down in 2020 following what had actually been an increase in 2019. And prior to that, we'd seen that giving remain mostly flat. So it's been an interesting kind of trend that we've seen here. The study also revealed that there's been some downturn as well for religious organizations and causes, foundations, and certain other health-related organizations, either flat or down in 2020. So the impact 
that these disparities in fundraising have had on the operations of a nonprofit really depend, depends again on the concentration of your revenue streams. What does your model look like? Organizations that had more diverse funding, uh, we really saw were, were insulated or were padded, right, from the pandemic and the potential disruptions that were brought about uh, along with the social justice movements of 2020 and 2021. So as a result of these disruptions, we've really seen a lot of the organizations that we're particularly working with reevaluating their business models by establishing or strengthening their long-term asset pools. So those rainy day funds that we'll actually talk about here in a second. Uh, we've seen some more invigorating fundraising efforts or getting those re-ramped up again, and then also leveraging technology to ensure that they're able to relieve the in-person engagement. So thinking through artificial intelligence or robotic process automation, a lot of this digital transformation that we've talked about for a couple of years now has really seen a big swing. In fact, they've called 2020 the great accelerant, which means that 2020 is actually the new 2025. And there's been um, a thought out there that we have actually accelerated our digital transformation process five to eight years ahead of where we were um, basically trending towards prior to the pandemic. The next one I have here, conferences and meetings. If you're an association, if you are an organization that is membership-based and has a lot of conferences and meetings, is hybrid here to stay? Uh, I think that's the big question that we're kind of all asking ourselves. So obviously, there's been a lot of financial challenges specifically related to C6 organizations who didn't get that first round of PPP funding because they weren't included in that. Um, but, you know, in terms of the event planners, you know, I have a big heart for them these days. They're expected to forecast revenue and expenses without any type of data, with any type of clear guidepost out there at all. Uh, and we've actually heard some reports that event planners are having to redo their predictions multiple times, seven times plus. So, you know, a lot of them are really questioning what the exercises uh, related to these future outlooks are, especially because it's just, we can't see what's coming down the road. So everyone agrees that planning hybrid events um, takes significantly more time, it's more effort, and it's certainly more money. So a lot of organizations are starting to really wane, what's my investment versus the experience for the people that are either in person and serving a virtual audit audience at the same time. So looking at the trend, hopefully optimism is continuing to grow for businesses, uh, events returning later. Hopefully this year, there were a couple of in-person events that I was lucky enough to attend in 2021 during the latter half of the year. Um, you know, we've seen some hotels that are really starting to write these more aggressive signing, uh, signed agreements, adding some clauses in there related to challenges of penalties and getting out of contracts. So we really are starting to continue to see event professionals in particular in the nonprofit space um, be tasked with something that is quite frankly unknown at this time. So the next item here is saving for a rainy day fund. Now the events of 2020 obviously reinforced that there is a needed preparation for nonprofits. It's crucial, it is critical to the survival of an organization. So having a reserve fund um, you know, should another pandemic arise, should there be something unforeseen, again, that comes up in terms of expenditures that you have to um, give some cash outlay for, is certainly a best practice recommendation that we've given um, for several years. And as Max had already noted, there is now a continued going concern um, that we really have to pay attention to as auditors. So looking at organizations across the board, nonprofits across the board, there's obviously not a one size fits all type of answer in terms of how much in reserves that you should have. In the past, we've put in an aim of about three to six months of operating expenditures, but I'm starting to think now that we're here in the pandemic, almost a solid two years later, that that time should actually increase to about at least a one year reserve for a rainy day fund. In terms of endowments, if you have those, Looking at two times the annual operating uh, budget is typically the industry standard, but ensuring that you are building this reserve, we understand has been really challenging in terms of fundraising for those capital uh, contributions to endowments, right? Donors really are starting to prefer to give to specific initiatives. They're not looking to give money so that it sits in a pool and you just get to work off of their earnings per se. Um, so really ensuring that you are looking at the pandemic and you are taking it into a place where you're using that as a catalyst for your fundraising efforts is probably the first step here. 
In terms of the labor market, I think that we all know that we are having challenges. Uh, you know, GRF is of no exception. I know the organizations that we're working for are actively and heavily recruiting for executives all the way down to staff levels. So this return to work um, is really a big uh, sticking point right now when it comes to the conversations and what the workforce is gonna look at. Uh, obviously with the reopening, we're seeing an uneven recovery. We've seen um, different types of generations saying, hey, you know what, if you're not gonna offer me a fully remote environment when it comes to working, I'm just not gonna take the job off right now and I'm gonna see what comes down the road because there has to be something out there. You know, talented people, culture are related to one another. So company culture still has to remain a priority for you and for your organization. So ensuring that there isn't resistance to change, uh, we understand there is resistance to change, um, that's always a big concern when it comes to the environment for a culture, for an organization. Rising labor costs. I mean, this is obviously top of mind for everybody. We've seen um, compensation have to increase across the board. So the pandemic has just increased workforce mobility. It's left companies with open positions that are um, being unstaffed at this time. And again, people are less willing to work for those minimum wage type of arrangements and wanting the more flexibility and uh, benefits. So ensuring that that's uh, top of mind is something that we have been talking about here within our firm as well. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, elevated importance for sure when it comes to the work culture and the labor force. So ensuring that we're taking those shifts and perspectives and the expectations about social issues and priorities and really assessing those at an organizational level, ensuring you have policies and processes around your recruitment, around your retention, career advancement, and your reward systems, um, making sure that you as leaders, for those of you who are leaders on this call, are addressing those rising expectations uh, in the what we now are dubbing the ESG reporting workspace, right? The environmental, the social, and the governance. So while that's something that a lot of publicly traded organizations and, pri and public companies and some even private companies are really looking hard at, uh, we are starting to see that kind of wane into the nonprofit sector more heavily as the time has uh, passed on. The last piece here that I have um, is on cryptocurrency. So Max kind of alluded to this earlier. It's not just a passing fad. Um, you know, I think a few of us five years ago thought it would be a passing fad, but we've seen it actually come to the forefront here within the pandemic. In terms of fundraising, we've seen a lot of donors who actually want to give money um, or donations, I should say, not even money in cryptocurrency, right? So it's really starting to gain popularity. We're looking at NFTs, those non-fungible tokens as well, unique assets that now an organization is going to have to sit back and say, do we have the gift acceptance policy to really help and outline with this? Are we going to accept it? And then how do you value that? So um, Max already alluded to it as well, but we do have that special webinar again that I'm going to plug one more time on February 8th at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Check out our website, www.grfcpas.com uh, and make sure you are registered for that to learn more a little bit about it, especially if it's something that maybe your organization hasn't yet gotten into, but you are starting to look into. In terms of cybersecurity, the last item that here, there was a big rush to go virtual in terms of aspects of operations and so those may have inadvertently created unknown security weaknesses, particularly when it comes to the humans. Um, so in terms of that, cybersecurity remains top of mind. I'm actually going to toss this topic over to uh, my partner and colleague, Melissa, to talk a little bit about that, our risk and advisory partner. So Melissa, take it away. All right, thank you. And um, so yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Musser, um, Director of Risk Advisory Services, and cybersecurity is the top risk. And that's not surprising, um, but also it's um, it's a top risk because cybersecurity can mean so many different things to different organizations, depending on their context. Um, cybersecurity includes concepts such as privacy, um, business continuity, disaster recovery, ransomware, third party risk management, the risk that those third parties can pose to you. So it really um, is pretty wide and vast and it really can look differently um, depending on your organization's context, but you really can't escape it. And so at this point, board members really have a responsibility for risk oversight, and that's always been the case, but you really can't get away with saying you didn't know cyber was a top risk, right? All, you, you just can't get away with it these days. So more and more board members are really starting to demand solid information on what is being done, like what are our risks and what is being done to mitigate those risks. And those conversations um, need to be had at a sufficient level and they need to be documented in, in the board minutes, if not the board minutes, the audit committee minutes. And so we're really seeing a lot of activity in the nonprofit space in this area. 
And what is communicated, what needs to be communicated is the results of a cybersecurity risk assessment or a cybersecurity audit that was done on an annual basis because the results of those will help feed into the required policies and procedures, right? Your required key controls that you need to have, um, whether it's over access or you know, your, your privacy policy, donor policy, or maybe it's a ransomware incident response policy. So, um, so that just wanted to let you know, there's a lot of information out there. We're seeing a, a large um, increase in that area. GRF just issued a white paper on top risk today. Um, you can check out our LinkedIn page and also our website. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to talk about virtual audits. Thanks, Melissa. So we're wrapping up year two of the pandemic, and I think we're all coming to the realization that virtual audits are going to be part of our lives, probably permanently to some extent or another. So here we have some of the, uh, the benefits that have come out of the expanded virtual approach and some of the more challenging things. So I'd like to highlight the, the use of technology for increased efficiency, whether that's an organization implementing a paperless accounts payable system or the use of new technologies on the audit side, such as data analytics or artificial intelligence. We have new tools that have been uh, pushed ahead and, and are really causing increased efficiency, but also hopefully increased um, effectiveness of our audits so that we can really focus on the areas that are of higher risk and that we really want to look at and end up with a better quality audit overall. There are some challenges and continuing uh, issues, whether it's you can't get on Zoom, you can't get your, your headset to work, um, but I think the biggest one is the potential loss of personal connection. So we can't walk down to the, the client's office anymore. We have to really be mindful about setting up those, those meetings to make sure that we are checking in. And the same goes for our, our staff at our own organization. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone is, is part of the culture and, and really feeling like they're part of the team. So that's the, the biggest challenge that we've all encountered over this past year. We have to go to the next slide, skip over. Um, some of the priorities, you know, as you're heading into your audit this year, whether you hate virtual audits or you love them, um, preparation is definitely key. We are recommending that you or the client prepares the, the PVC requests at least two weeks in advance of the scheduled virtual audit. And that way the auditor has time to plan accordingly, um, do the sampling and get some of those items and questions over in advance. Uh, in the virtual environment, we do find things that take a little bit longer to turn around, so it's critical. The second point is maintaining audit focus during the scheduled audit time. We, we recognize that clients and, and accounting staff have many priorities on a day-to-day -day basis and, and they're being pulled in different directions. But what we don't wanna do is end up out of sight, out of mind um, during the audit week or weeks that we have scheduled. So we highly recommend that management express to the entire organization just how critical the audit is and how time consuming and stressful it can be sometimes for the accounting staff and make sure that they have the space and the time that they need locked out to really focus on um, providing our, our responses and our questions. It, it avoids audit overages um, and also make sure that we get those deliverables done on time and, and makes everyone happy. Digital transformation, I know we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times, but if your organization is still one that is signing the paper checks or you know, going into the office solely to, to conduct some, some of those clerical duties that you, know, you could be uh, updating and, and implementing new, new softwares or new procedures to uh, basically make your organization more efficient, it's time to look into that and, and really see what you can do. It's going to improve the efficiency of your own organization and department, um, improve your controls, and also as a, as a byproduct, make the audit go smoother, which is great. Finally, communication throughout the year. This is always something that we encourage, but especially now with the complex issues that are coming up and the uncertainties, we really encourage um, you to reach out and, and go over issues, whether it's remaining at questions on revenue recognition, new COVID funding that you're getting during the year that you're not sure how to deal with, uh, that is a great resource and it's gonna avoid surprises, which nobody likes when we audit. These are just some of the topics to consider going over with your auditor or you know, at least considering as you approach audit time. A lot of organizations have had staff leave and start 
and changes in software and numerous things throughout the year. So this is an opportunity to review those, make sure that there are no vulnerabilities that you might've missed and, and document them for the audit process. As far as changes in delivery of programs and the staffing, you know, again, anything that has happened major during the year, we wanna understand that in regards to the audit so that we can plan our analytics properly, um, understand, you know, maybe you were in person before and now you're providing virtual programs. Maybe you're, you are selling tickets and now you switched to being basically grant-based. Uh, due to COVID. So we just want to understand what you're doing and how that impacts the audit. Um, estimates and fair value measurements. Uh, Max had briefly mentioned this, you know, the inputs and the information you might have used for those in the past might not be relevant anymore, might not be available. There could be impairments that have occurred based on the challenges with COVID. And the other uh, potential is maybe after the end of the year, things have changed and we need to go back and see, you know, what do we need to disclose? So important to, to look at that as you prepare your, uh, your audit information. Lease changes, we all know the, the lease implementation is coming, um, but one additional consideration or complication is there have been a lot of concessions from landlords as a result of COVID. And as part of the process, uh, really need to take a look at what those are um, and how they impact the calculations going forward, um, just in addition to your regular lease standard implementation. And finally, going concern, uh, unfortunately, there's been continuing challenges to a lot of organizations over the past couple of years, and management really does need to assess if this could be potentially an issue. And if it is a potential issue, be prepared to provide additional information um, as we go into the audit, you know, whether that's you've redone the budget, you're restructuring your debt, um, plans to restructure operations, any mitigating uh, plans regarding those concerns. And then there has been an update to the audit evidence SAS. So the AIC AICPA recognizes that we are implementing these new technologies. Um, I mentioned data analytics, artificial intelligence, where we can use these automated um, abilities to, to review the, the entire general ledger and get a better look at what the high risk transactions are. So this standard is just really modernizing and, and recognizing that these types of uh, audit evidence are, um, are gonna be around <laughs> going forward. So they are sufficient and appropriate and we need to just make sure that we have the sufficient um, evidence to give our opinion. So that's really been an update and something that um, I think is just recognizing the fact that these new tools are, are gonna be going forward and, and available to us. Um, and the next slide is kind of along the same lines of recognizing that, you know, as Trisha had mentioned, we are working virtually, the clients are working virtually. There's a, a lot of uh, information going back and forth on the internet. And as a result, um, one tool that we have available is cybersecurity audits, which also can be done virtually. And I'm going to hand this over to Melissa as the expert to, to go a little bit more in depth on this. Great, thank you, Lindsay. So yes, in addition to financial statement audits, we have a robust cybersecurity audit practice. And um, you know what's exciting is cybersecurity audit technology has really transformed over the last several years. We're able to generate robust, easy to read reports on top threats and, and how to remediate those top threats more affordably than ever. Um, the technology has come a long way so much though that you would be shocked to find out um, who all can access and see your deficiencies without ever even hacking into your system. It used to be, you needed to be a sophisticated hacker or you can go into the dark web and get all this info, juicy information. And now it's just kind of common practice. It's out there. Um, um, insurance companies are running these um, assessments on you. They don't need your permission. Um, and basically they'll run the assessment on you and you'll automatically get put into a certain bucket or, or maybe you won't even be granted any kind of coverage. So it's real important to know really what is out there about you because vendors, um, donors, funders, they all can be running these scans on you. Um, and, and again, do not need your permission. So we can customize cybersecurity audits. You can go out there and get customized. Um, they're not really cookie cutter audits. Um, so really got to figure out what's important to you and what's your context. So typically it should include um, this external scan, kind of a reputation scan, like what is out there about you and what can you correct and fix? 
Um, and then you want to look at an internal assessment. What are your internal vulnerabilities? Maybe go as far as to doing penetration tests to see could a hacker break into your organization? And also importantly, really just looking at your policies and procedures. Do they make sense? Um, this should be looked at annually. So this could be part of your normal cybersecurity audit, cybersecurity risk assessment, really. And you could even benchmark against a certain standard such as ISO or NIST, or it really just depends on your um, regulatory requirements that you have. They're highly customizable and the price range can definitely range, um, but they can be affordable. So don't think you can't afford one. And uh, just please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. I love to talk about this stuff. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Amy for our next polling question. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we have come to the second polling question, but before we do that, I just wanna to touch base on one of the questions that came in the chat in case people didn't see it. Um, the question was, how will the lease statement impact entities reporting on a cash basis? And Max did answer, and, it, and as he noted, any entity that issues a gap basis financial statement will need to implement ASC 842, which is the lease standard. Entities that do not report their financial activity using GAAP, such as cash basis or income tax basis, may not be impacted by the lease standard. So just wanted to make sure that we clarified that for everyone else who may not have seen that in the chat. But on to our second polling question. Which answer best describes your organization in regard to remote work? A, we are confident remote work is safe and secure at our organization. B, we have taken steps since the beginning of the pandem pandemic to improve our cybersecurity. C, we still need to assess our cybersecurity and potential risk. D, we have experienced some cybersecurity issues. And E, unsure. Please take a moment now to answer. While the participants are submitting their answers, I'll provide the second CPE word. The second CPE word is threat. If you want to receive CPE credit, please jot the words down because you will need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the second CPE word is threat, T-H-R-E-A-T. Okay, so it looks like we have our, our answers here and 52% says we have taken steps since the beginning of the pandemic, which is great. 26% um, says we're confident remote work is safe. So that is also uh, positive news. I think you know, the, the bottom three, which thankfully are the lower percentages, um, are those that may still need to do some additional work. And now I am going to turn this over to, to Dick to talk about um, the nonprofit tax area. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's as you see from the slide there, 2021 was a very challenging year. Uh, the reason they probably put me last is because uh, uh, I'm going to probably give you some bad news and then hopefully some good news on what's happening in the area. But really want to uh, talk a little bit about how we how we got here and what the IRS and what the practitioner community is doing to address the number of issues that we have. And then uh, last, hopefully, I'll, I'll Max mentioned uh, employee retention credits. PPP loans. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know, what we've seen on the 990 presentation, just so that everybody's kind of up to speed. Uh, as I was thinking about this and preparing uh, this morning, I was going to use the, the term perfect storm. But for those of you on the East Coast, I think the more appropriate, uh, if you're watching the weather on the East Coast, is bomb cyclone, right? You got a bomb cyclone coming up the East Coast, uh, which will bring some snow maybe even to the DC area yet again this year. Um, but it really has been a, 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 a confluence of a lot of different things that have led us to be in this challenging position for, for organizations and for practitioners as well. Um, first of all, you know, we have the pan pandemic and we've got processing issues. And remember the IRS right now, and in, in, in you can tell it's going to be a challenging year when on the opening day, two days ago, on the opening day of tax filing season, you see it as the lead story on the morning news. The morning national news. The IRS is 35 million returns a backlog, and that's before the current filing system started. And obviously, the pandemic has been a challenge because returns are, by and large, uh, to, at least in the EO area, until recently, were filed by paper. And extensions, remember, and this is important, extensions can still be filed by paper. Um, so when you have a processing delay in the paper, 
and an e-filing with the return, you get some mismatches there. Um, so you've got the pandemic. E-filing became mandatory during uh, COVID, during the pandemic. And that has resulted in some challenges that we'll talk about. Um, existing business master file issues. So the business master file is what the IRS is, the information the IRS has about your organization. You can actually go on the IRS website, even if you Google IRS business master file, and you can look by state and by your EIN and find out the information that the IRS has on you. The reason that's important for e-filing is if the business master file is not correct and you try an e-file, it'll often get rejected. And then, um, but filing by paper is no longer allowed. So there's mismatches there that is caused by historic issues with the business master file. And that's really a result of you know, outdated IRS systems and historic budget cuts. So all those things came together uh, during the pandemic, during 2021, uh, filing season in particular to create all these issues. So what are some of those issues? You know, the backlog in processing paper forms um, has led to erroneous penalties. So you file your extension by paper um, and you file a return either by paper um, or probably electronically, there's a mismatch because the IRS will say, well, you never file an extension, therefore your 990 is late when you file it. When they get it, they'll see no extension and say you're late. So then you get a penalty notice. And of course the penalty notice is erroneous. So then you send in more correspondence. And then the IRS doesn't open that for months and months and months. And then you get a notice of intent to levy because the IRS systems are kicking things out. And we'll talk uh, in a little bit about what the AICPA and other groups are doing to try and alleviate that. So that's one of the things is that we get erroneous notices that we have to deal with. I mentioned about e-filing being rejected, right? Being rejected. And then we have to, you know, you can wait three days, you can call the IRS. Um, the IRS um, is not really good at answering the phone these days. They're inundated with phone calls because of these issues. You get what the practitioners will call a courtesy disconnect. So you're on hold for two hours and then you get this note that, oh, by the way, um, we're too busy, call back later and they cut you off without even getting to speak to anybody. Um, uh, then there is the, erroneous uh, revocation of exempt status. So let's say you're a smaller organization, maybe you didn't file, you didn't know you had to file a 990N and then your third year you're filing a return, you filed a paper extension for your return, but the IRS doesn't, hasn't processed it yet, automatically the website's gonna show that you're being rejected. And so now when people go to try and give to you, if they look on the IRS systems, they're gonna see, wait a minute, you're no longer exempt, you've been revoked, I can't get a charitable contribution for giving to you. Now, the good news in that regard is that the IRS has, um, uh, as you'll see, there's a, uh, on, the, on the, the next slide, I'll show you, there's a dedicated, um, there's a dedicated uh, fax number that uh, practitioners have been using to do that. So the other thing is processing for applications of exemptions have been delayed. And what's happened is the IRS has actually allowed, you know, um, submitted the approval for the exemption, but the taxpayers or the organizations haven't, haven't uh, been notified yet. So there's a lot of things going on here. So bad news is the impacts are expected to carry over into this filing season. As I mentioned, you know, when the IRS is 35 million returns, probably mostly individual and corporate returns delayed in processing, um, you know, you know, it's off to a, a bumpy start there. Uh, good news is the IRS is aware of these issues and working very closely. I'm a member of the AICPA Technical Resource Panel for Exempt Organizations. We meet with IRS twice a year. We've notified them. They're willing to work with us. But remember, like all of us, they have you know, uh, resource issues, both you know, in individuals and in their systems. Um, the IRS has, um, when you finally get somebody, they're often really helpful. But the challenge is getting somebody. Um, the IRS did say, um, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, because uh, I think the, the line is open till about 7 p.m. are the best times to call. Uh, we've had some success early in the day, um, but, uh, but it seems to me that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, middle of the week may be the best time to call. Just a little tip for you there. Um, the IRS also did issue a notice on certain things like where's your 990 if you know you didn't file late but they hadn't processed. 
uh, you know, you had filed, but they hadn't processed it. Um, they would tell you to stop, just don't respond to the notice. As you can imagine, as a practitioner, when a client gets a notice and they're very, uh, you know, their level of anxiety is up and we tell them we're not going to respond because it just creates more paper. Um, that's not always the best um, uh, answer for, for, for the practitioners or for uh, our clients. So um, that's been something the IRS has put out there, but not everybody would be following that because of, they feel like they need to respond. Um, the IRS is, is, you know, these automatic notices are going out. Um, and some of them rise to the notice of intent to levy, which means they could take assets from your bank accounts. And that really raises the level of anxiety for clients. Uh, the, when you call, one of our recommendations is you call and you get a hold placed on the notice of intent to levy. But from what I'm hearing, the longest hold they'll give you is about 30 days, which is not long enough with the backlog of processing going on. The good news is before they will take any assets, they will assign it to a person who may call the organization when they don't see any activity. And so then at least you can say, look, this is erroneous. I don't owe it. Here's the paperwork I submitted. They just haven't processed it yet. So there are some workarounds there. Um, the IRS, as you'll see, is also hiring more staff um, to help resolve delays. They've hired 120 individuals through fiscal 2021, conducted 245 interviews to fill 132 revenue agent um, and are preparing a large hiring campaign for 2022. So that's good news. IRS and uh, the exempt orgs and uh, division and the 990 software providers have been working to try and resolve the, the um, e-filing issues. And I think that 2022 will be um, smoother. Uh, also, the uh, as I mentioned, the AICPA, uh, including the EOTRP, TEG Council and the ADA have been very active in identifying these issues and raising them uh, up to the level of uh, um, you know, the, the, the appropriate people in the agencies to try and get a workaround. Um, there is one issue for 990Ts if you file with a payment on 517, because that's the extended due date, because 515 was over a weekend. Um, we are aware of an issue where the IRS is applying that to the wrong tax year. It should apply to the previous tax year if you file an extension. Um, the IRS is aware of it. There is no system-wide fix. Um, you may have to call and get the move and get the money moved to the right tax year, which can be done. But again, it, it may be time-consuming. Um, I talked about the the penalty notices coming out. There is a the AICPA is very active in building a coalition on HR fifty one fifty five, the Taxpayer Penalty Protection Act, and it's basically saying stop sending these until you can catch up. Stop sending these notices and put, kind of put a put a moratorium, if you will. Um, on some of those things. So um, AICPA is aware of it, the practitioners are aware of it. There's a lot going on. The IRS is receptive. They're just somewhat limited under current conditions. And real quick on 990s, um, uh, Max mentioned uh, employee retention credit. The ERC, uh, from a tax side, we usually see that as a credit as a reduction of those expenses. For financial statement purposes, it's showing as revenue. And for 990 purposes, we can generally follow uh, financial statements according to the instructions in the, in the uh, 990. So you may see that shown as a contribution, which um, can actually help your public support test because um, it's a government contribution. So we may see some uh, different presentations on a 990 uh, because of the employee retention credit. And on the PPP loans for this filing year, we're seeing a lot of that uh, forgiveness coming in as government uh, contributions on line uh, one of part eight, which again helps the helps the, uh, um, the public support test. Um, one issue that I think Trisha and some of the other folks mentioned with, with revenue might be down. So looking at your functional expense statement, if some of your programmatic revenue is down, I've seen situations where the functional expense for program, program percentage has gone down versus the previous or the historic rates there. So just some things we're seeing. I think a lot of these things are gonna get resolved in 2022, but it's still going to be a, a bumpier filing season than we'd like. So with that, I will uh, turn it back for, I believe, our last um, polling question to Amy. Yes, thank you, Dick. Um, we've come to our third and final polling question. Regarding your current staffing levels, do you, A, believe you are adequately staffed, B, 
currently searching for additional staff to help fulfill mission and programs, or C, believe the talent pool is difficult to navigate currently. Please take a moment to answer. While you are submitting your answers, I will provide with you with the third CPE word. The third CPE word is exemption. If you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you will need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the third CPE word is exemption. E-X-E-M-P-T-I-O-N. Okay, and we can look at the status of uh, the, the findings from poll number three, uh, and, and it's B, um, basically currently searching for additional staff to help fulfill the mission and programs at really 60%. Um, I guess that's really probably what we would have expected to see is that everyone is hiring, everyone is looking for additional staff at this point. I think some of the, the great resignation is affecting all industries, so um, I think that is definitely um, common in everyone, and we, I guess we have to figure out and navigate this way through us to, through the through this hiring together. And then, basically, I would like to thank everyone who took part in our survey in preparation for this session, uh, and give congratulations to our gift card winner, who is Lois Taylor. So, congratulations! You will be receiving a five hundred dollar gift card from GRF CPAs and Advisors. And then we would now like to answer any questions that are coming through. Um, and ultimately a few, I, we did answer that first one. I have another one here that basically says, how do you foresee the future of audits to go? And I don't know if any of our panelists would like to take a, a stab at answering that. Sure, Amy, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, so in terms of the future of the audits, I think that we all are, are sensing that hybrid is going to take the forefront from that standpoint. Um, you know, again, as Lindsay was talking about, we are definitely missing those water cooler type of conversations with our clients, with our in-person, with our staff. Um, we also believe that we can sense things better when we speak to people in person by body language. Um, so we're really looking and hoping that we can at least get on site for a day or two, at least here for, for GRF uh, in terms of those, those audits. But obviously, we've been doing virtual audits for a number of years with several of our clients, and we've been effective, we've been efficient. Um, so I, you know, I think it's really up to the organizations, it's really up to uh, the team members to ensure that we're able to adequately, you know, come across with our professional skepticism in terms of being able to um, validate some of the, you know, experiences that we have when it comes to our, our organizations that we're auditing. Um, but, you know, that would be what I would foresee for the ongoing future. Thanks, Tricia. Um, another question we received was about the trend of real estate and what we're seeing with our clients. Um, and I think that, you know, some of the panelists can channel can chime in, but I think there's there's a lot of things out there going on between clients who have buildings who are trying to sell them and, and really get rid of that property or clients who are in leases and trying to get out of those leases. Um, and some that have done, you know, extensive um, looks at what the, the next steps are to do and basically are staying in their lease. But I think, I don't know if there's any other panelists who wanted to talk about maybe some of their experiences of what they're seeing in the real estate with their clients. I think it's been a mix as well. I've heard of uh, several clients that are trying to capitalize on the current market to uh, sell property that maybe they've been hanging on to for a long period of time. Um, a lot of a lot of organizations trying to restructure their leases and shorten them or get smaller space for sure. I think I think oh, one ahead. of the other interesting trends to Amy is that amid this new standard for leases, <laughs> a lot of organizations we've actually been seeing trying to enter into leases that are short term. Um, to basically not to get into that lease standard because it is complicated. Um, it's it's a difficult calculation and it's 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 going to pose some critical thinking I think on both ends uh, for the the lessor and the lessee. But I've seen a lot of organizations who are looking at those short term kind of collab spaces 
uh, and entering into a lot of those for their staff versus a, a longer term lease as well. And then I see a question here in the chat about PPP loan forgiveness recorded as a government contribution, as I know Dick had just mentioned that um, on the 990. And, and ultimately, I think that depends on how you have selected to treat your PPP. Um, if you uh, treated it as a loan, it would be a gain on extinguishment of debt. But if you treated it as a uh, a, a government grant basically, and then basically had maybe it as refundable advance or basically recorded it as a grant when you met the, the applicable terms of the, uh, of the arrangement, then that was recorded as a government grant. Um, I don't know, Dick, if there's anything else on that you wanted to highlight on the 990 side. No, and typically, um, again, the, the, I, the, IRS guidance has been that you recognize it as income in the year it's forgiven. But I think there is also a position in some practitioners, uh, some of my colleagues, and I have kicked this around quite a bit. And if the financial statements treat it as a, um, as a contribution um, rather than a loan and then a forgiveness, you know, I think there's a position to say on the 990, you would treat it as a contribution in that year uh, as well. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, the general rule is following 990 presentation generally follows, um, you know, financial statement presentation. So I, I think the IRS guidance was a little bit incomplete in the sense that it was thinking that everybody was going to treat it as a loan and then forgiveness. Um, so um, I, you, you may see a little bit different treatment there because of that, uh, because of that little bit difference. Thanks, Dick. Um, one other question here we had about uh, that I'm seeing here in the chat that we can talk about was um, the PPP and the ERC revenue um, and uniform guidance. Um, basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of CARES Act revenue that is subject to uniform guidance, but the PPP, for example, is not one of those. So no, they are not forcing uh, you know, clients into uniform guidance audits because we are not actually including the PPP on our SEPA is something that, that is, is exempt basically, I guess, from the uniform guidance treatment. Um, and that is similar for the, the employee retention credit as well. But there is other CARES Act funding and different COVID funding. So you may want to you know, be, keep your eye on that and be careful and get guidance if, you're, if you are not sure what could trigger uh, a uniform guidance audit. And then I think there's one other question, and I think it's a it's on the lease standard again, and, and asking about copier leases and postage machine leases. Um, I don't know, Max, if you want to talk about say, that. Yeah, I can say a few words about that. So, so the the short answer is yes. The standard does apply to equipment leases. Um, what would was historically considered a capital lease that would be subject to the new standard. Uh, the important consideration is the term of the lease. If it's uh, for a short term, uh, twelve months or less. Um, extending out from the financial statement date, you would be able to uh, omit um, applying the new standard. Uh, but generally, if it's a longer term lease, you do need to go through the calculation and, and think about including it. Um, now, the concept of materiality, you know, is always kind of considered um, when you're looking at this new standard, but generally there is no exemption for any specific type of lease. Thanks, Max. Um, I think that really we're pretty much out of time. So we would, with that, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's discussion. We encourage you to follow us on social media at GRFCPAs and visit our website at www.grfcpa.com for upcoming events and alerts. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.